In this section, we'll look at what it means to be a nonlinear image by investigating the relationship between brightness levels in an image. You can very quickly understand why you have to make certain decisions that you do uh, depending upon whether the image is linear or not, and why it might affect the choices that you make in terms of the tools you use in PixInsight to manage your data. In order to investigate all of this, one of the best tools I think to use is one of these things called a grayscale tablet. This is now a gradient of discrete brightness levels uh, going from black to white. And this is what I would call a nice screen representation, a bitmap of this image. It's actually a, J a JPEG image. In other words, the astronomical data that you generally use is going to have much, much finer uh, brightness levels because it might be 16-bit data. Here, we're only going to be looking at basically 8-bit data. And these values represent then the grayscale value, the brightness, at each of these steps as represented as numbers that go from zero, which is black, all the way to white, which is 255, that is 256 grayscales. Now, if I use my little readout tool at the moment, it's not going to give me that representation. It's going to give me the normalized representation going from zero to one. So if we look at the midpoint, which is going to be 127 or 128 here, in terms of our grayscales, we should see 0.5 for the RGB values, and we do. But I really wanted to read there 128. I wanted to match on the screen, um, on our readout screen, what it shows as our label. We can do that. We can just force the readout option over here to be of the same mode. Now it's going to, my flyout is just off the screen here, so I encourage you to do this on your own. Click the arrow, and then there is an integer range that you can select, and you just select 8-bit. Now when I put my cursor here on one of these bars, and I click, you'll see the RGB value matches the label. So now everything is going to be um, apples for apples and oranges for oranges. So we've got 64 here, 104 here. And mid-gray, of course, should again be 128. Now let's go ahead and load this image into our histogram transformation tool. We'll select this as a view. And what we'll get are each of these basically uh, discrete steps showing up as a bar in our histogram. So for every step we see here, we should have a bar. And if we knew the total number of steps, I think it's 32, we're going to see 32 bars here if you count them. You'll notice the bars are not quite perfect, and that deals, among other things, with the fact that these numbers are here. They add a little bit extra um, grayscale values, both bright and dark, and so they have a little bit of extra stuff here. So you ignore that and ignore the fact that the heights are also not exactly equivalent, doesn't matter. We're only concerned with the relationship uh, between one brightness level to the next, and that basically means the spacing, because we're going to compare input values here to output values up above. And the important thing about the spacing you should recognize instantly here is that for these uh, discrete steps, and you can see, just so you know, these steps are in units of eight in terms of our grayscale values. They are equal here, of course, in the histogram, they are equal as they are labeled, but truly, the histogram is plotting those brightness levels, and they are precisely equally spaced. Once we start making this a nonlinear image, the, the spacing will not be equal, and of course, the graphical representation, the relationship from one brightness level to the other, if they're not equal, is nonlinear. The function then that defines that relationship is what is being drawn here as this currently, it's as a line. So this is called the MTF curve. And that really gives away uh, this idea of how you make a nonlinear image. The M stands for the midtones transfer function. So the function is the line, the transfer is the, you know, the transformation, but 
Midtones means by adjusting this caret, we're going to change the relationship here, the midtone, the midpoint, uh, between these values in terms of our output representation, our output values, and make it from a linear to a nonlinear representation of the data. As much as you might want me to at this moment manipulate this little caret, I'm not going to do it yet. I want to keep things linear because I want to show you what that really means, um, why we have this diagonal line here. So let's begin by doing this transformation. Now you might think, well, I haven't done anything yet. Well, that's exactly right. This is a transformation. It is just the, uh, the identity transformation. We're going to take the input values and make them the output values. Here I will apply, and you will see, of course, nothing seems to happen. But something did happen. Um, for a value of 64, we just outputted a value of 64. And if we plot that, I, I made a little Excel thing. So I have input values here, and then I have output values here if they are equal to one another. Let's go ahead and select all of these values. Oh, that is not what I wanted to do. What I want to do is select them, and then graph them. Insert, scatter. You will find that we get a line that is precisely what is being shown in PixInsight. That is the MTF curve, it is the transfer curve, it is the function that determines the relationship between input and output pixel value. Now if we change this relationship between input and output, of course we're going to get a different kind of function. Let's keep things linear though. I'm going to make some adjustments to both the white and the black point. Now what you want to monitor is what's going on in the output sense. I'm going to raise my black level a certain number of brightness steps here. So this first bar represents the 8, uh, the value 8. The next bar, of course, represents 16 in terms of our grayscale steps here. And then the bar after that represents 24 and so on. So if I raise this, my black level to 8, now, did you see what happened on the upper screen? That bar that represent, represents 8 goes off to the left edge, becomes 0, which is exactly what we're trying to do. And then I could make the 16 go to 0, that bar, and then uh, it's at 0. And then this bar is a 24. We would make it go to 0 as well. So now, if I apply what we've just done, I should find that after the application of the... Uh, HT tool here that this is going to be black, the 8 bar is going to be black, the 16 bar is going to be black, the 24 bar is going to be black. Let's do the other end as well. Let's just ra uh, lower the, uh, the white point. So here's a bar that's already the white point. So, and I can't do the math in my head, but we have a 248, a 240, and a 232. So let's go, here is the 248, then we go to the 240, and then the 232. Again, you find that those lines have shifted off to the right. We have clipped them because we're now going to say that all of these values are white until we get to this point. And then we have our grayscales in between. What this means is that we have fewer bars in the upper graph now because we have clipped some of those brightness levels here. So the spacing between these bars has changed, but they're still equal, which means they're still going to plot a line when we graph them. Now, what you'll notice is the line now has a different slope than it once had. It goes a little bit higher than it once was because we have manipulated these uh, white and black points, but it's still a line. That much hasn't changed. So the spacing has changed because now we're taking a fewer number of grayscales, val original grayscale values, and we're stretching them to fill this new space that goes from all the way black to all the way white. That is a kind of contrast um, enhancement, if you will. Let's go ahead and apply this result and see what it does to the image. Let's see that it does exactly what we said. Indeed, it did. You'll notice here that we now have 0, 8, 16, 24, 32, all being displayed as black. And at the top end, 
we have the 255, the 248, 240, and 232 all being displayed as precisely white. I'll undo and redo. Redo and undo. So this curve we should be able to reproduce in Excel, of course, if I just force these values to the ones here to all be black. But now these these grayscales have new they have new values actually. So the 32 has a new value here. It's nine. And the 40 has a new value, it's 19. And the 48 has a new value, it's 29. So from 19 to 29 to 39, there should see a pattern developing here, to 48, oh, it's close, to 58, to 68. I hope you'll agree that we have units of 10. So now there's a relationship between these values. It's not a one to one. Now the step size is a units of, or before it was units of eight, now it's units of 10 between these values here. So all I should have to do is in Excel, I call this one zero. This value, 16, was also 0. 24 was 0. And then we started at the value of 32. The output, the new output, as I recall, was 9. And then the relationship is that every other value after that equals this value plus 10. That was the new relationship. So I go so far, all the way down here, until we get to a point where it's going to go over our white value. White value is 255, right? So this value here is obviously going to be entirely white, so that's 255. And then these values are also going to be 255, 255, and 255. This graph now is precisely synonymously the same as the graph that we were seeing for our MTF function here still linear, but different in its slope, different in how we are representing these new grayscale output grayscale values. Let's go ahead and uh, undo this and come back to our original and see what it means then to make an actual nonlinear adjustment. Let's just blindly adjust the midpoint and watch what happens to the graph up above. I'm going to slide our midpoint value and make it smaller, which is a very typical kind of thing that is done. Uh, you'll notice that the graph, uh, uh, the output representation of these relationship of these brightness levels has changed. We still see the same total number of bars However, all the ones that were over on this side of the, the input are now getting all squished over here to the right side. And all of these values here, well, their spacing has changed. So we have big spacing here getting to smaller and smaller spacing on the right. Um, just so you know, symmetrically, if I go the other way with the midpoint, so if I put it back at the midpoint, they're equal, and then if I make it a a larger than this midpoint value, you'll find everything gets squished over to the left. So just by looking at the output representation, we can instantly say, even if you didn't show me what was going on with the image, which we're not actually seeing until we apply, I can tell you how that image is being manipulated in this nonlinear way. I can predict what the image is going to look like, no problem. Let's reset this and think about what this means, or at least take a stab at uh, displaying this relationship. So I'm going to do the, this relationship here, where we're lowering our midpoint. Um, again, we've changed our spacing, and now this MTF curve it really is a curve. 
it makes it is some function. I don't know what the function is. I couldn't tell you by looking at the curve, but it is some smooth function. Why don't we go ahead and generate that curve ourselves? Let's just like we did a moment ago with a line, but let's just make the curve. Now I won't have you watch me do it. It's really kind of boring, but we'll make the adjustment to the image. There's the image, the new output values, right? And what I'm going to do off screen is I'm going to take each of these. So this is still zero. They didn't change, but now the eight has become a 33 and the 16 has become a 60 and the 24 and 82 and I will go ahead and in my Excel uh, little representation I will go through and fill each of these out and we'll see a function develop which should again match what we're seeing over there um, in PixInsight. Let me do that off screen one second. So here I've inputted those values and we have our new curve. And this curve, of course, is exactly the same as the curve that we're seeing here. Of course, there's a different ratio on the screen of how the curve is being displayed, but it is exactly the same function. So now I hope you appreciate exactly this relationship uh, for this function and how you're getting from an input to an output value and how that affects the, uh, the overall distribution of those brightness levels. Let me undo some of this because I'm really just interested in looking at this graph of what happens when we manipulate these values. So I have back the original image and let's look at the meaning behind this non-linear adjustment and it'll help us understand why the image looks the way it does when we make the adjustment. So I'm going to lower this midpoint value, this thing that we're calling gray in the original we're going to say has a new output value at a different spot. So let's put it down here, I don't know, about halfway between what was the midpoint gray and the black point. I've lowered it to this new value here. So what you can imagine happening is that we are now taking these values here, which is a larger set of brightnesses than once was because we were taking it from the midpoint, which would have been 16 values, but now we're actually doing more than 16. We're doing 20 something values, and we need to output all 20 of those in the upper graph between the new midpoint, the new 50% gray and white. That means we have to squish what was equally spaced down here into a smaller region up here. And of course, this relationship is not going to be a one-to-one -one, uh, kind of that input-to-output linear relationship that we had a moment ago. It's determined by this function here. Because at the same time we're taking all these values and somehow squishing them in here, we're taking all of the brightness levels that now go from the black point to this new uh, midpoint or 50% gray when we output it and we're taking these values and now they have to fill that space and we saw before even when it, even when it was linear that increases the uh, the steps between those brightness levels and so indeed we see these larger steps though ever decreasing until they get to that midpoint decreasing and decreasing until they all kind of get squished together all the way furthest to the right so this new relationship is obviously non-linear. Uh, but what it does is something typical that we do with our astronomical images. We're generally, uh, in our astronomical images, generally things that are down here, that's where all the interesting stuff is. Now all these brightness levels that are in the original unstretched information, all of this stuff here would be represented by stars and you know just a couple of handful of bright things all the interesting nebulosity, the galaxies, and everything else, it's all very, very dark, at least until we stretch the information. Now, we know already how to do a screen stretch, but now we're talking about permanent stretches, which is what this tool does. So by taking a small range of what is initially inputted as dark, and then we output that into a larger range 
in this case going between the, the zero and now the new determined midpoint value. It's kind of like we're stretching that information. Now, because these are discrete levels, it seems like you know you have a you have a brightness here and then a new brightness here. But of course, when we're looking at real data, it has a complete continuum um, of all of those brightness levels. So what that gives us is greater contrast. We're going to make the distinguishing uh, feature between the the sky values, things that are very dark, and things that are at this new gray, easier to discern because now we've divided this range into this larger space. It's as if we've made new grayscales, uh, grayscale values available to this what used to be a smaller um, relationship, a smaller space of grayscale values here. We've now expanded that into a larger kind of grayscale region to display these units. So that gives us greater contrast. It makes these features look brighter because once was something that was relatively dim now becomes something that is considerably brighter and therefore easier to see. But at the other end, all the bright stuff, well, things that used to be kind of brightish up here are now less easy to distinguish from one another. That means that things that were almost white look very nearly white. Lots of things look very nearly white that might have been easier to distinguish, to discern before. So that means that what we're going to see here are many more of these divisions over on the left side showing up with a little more ease, but the divisions on the right side are going to be less easy to tell because they will all be much more similar to one another. Let's see if all of what I've said is basically true. Let's go ahead and apply uh, this setting to this image. Again, we, we already graphed it, but let's do it again. Indeed, now you'll see the divisions over on the left are much easier to discern. Let's look at that again. They're very difficult to see the divisions here, the very dimmest, faintest features, but now no problem at all. At the bright end, though, it's very difficult to see where these divisions are. So let's use our newfound skill to analyze a histogram that perhaps you, you haven't seen before. So I'm going to undo. So this is the original image. I took the original grayscale tablet, and I've already modified a version of it down below here. Let me just reset this tool. So this is the, again, the linear, completely original representation. And then I have an image here. I'm not going to even show you the image but we are now seeing the representation, the histogram of this image. And just by looking at the histogram, we can say something about how this image is going to uh, be different or a modified version of the original. What, what is going to be the difference? Well, what you'll notice is in the midtones, that is in these values that are near 50% gray, there is an increase of spacing there are more grayscales being allocated, if you will, because this is the output. I know it's the same here, but this is the output of the original. So there are more grayscales being allocated to discern what was originally the middle values here of the original image. And at each side, towards the white point and the black point, there are less discernible discrete brightness levels available because there's kind of that compression uh, that we see towards each of these ends. So in terms of a contrast adjustment, this would be a mid-tones contrast adjustment. Anytime you see that in a histogram, this kind of expansion of the area that we're allocating to more grayscales, then that's going to be an increase of discernible potential discernible contrast in that in that brightness regime so let's look at the image and see if all of that is true here's what the image looks like indeed compared to the original you'll notice that these values here are much easier to discern whereas all the very dark values are now very difficult to see the difference in. And the very bright values, the same is true. So the contrast occurred um, more in the middle part of the 
uh, of the region, if you will. So this is what is basically called a contrast curve. That's the curve that I made to do this, and I use the curves transformation tool to do it. Now I have a separate section that explains how to use this tool, but here's the curve that I use to generate this histogram making this image. So that's why if you've ever seen curves of this kind of S shape, now you can appreciate why that's a contrast curve. You can appreciate it in a different way just by looking at the histogram. Now we can look at the last little fields that I haven't had a chance to talk about, but we can truly figure out how they work uh, basically by looking at, using our skill, of looking at the histogram and seeing what it does. So there's a low range slider down here as well as a high range slider. Let's go ahead and make an adjustment and you know see what happens. As I lower the low range, you'll find that all of these brightness values that are represented in this image, they all shift to the right. Now what this means is that this first bar here, which was zero here in the original input, is now being outputted at some much brighter gray value. And then all of the other brightness values, they're still being represented, but they take up the rest of the space. Notice that they're all there. I mean, all the lines that were here are here, uh, but they're much more closely spaced. So if I were to graph what just happened, then the following description I think would be appropriate. Notice how, unfortunately, they chose not to, they show what happens to the curve, this outputted plotted curve when you make adjustments here, but they chose not to show it when you make an adjustment to the sliders. I, I think that's a little unfortunate because it would give you some hint as to what it's doing. This by starting at this point here, that's going to raise this left side because that's the y-intercept where, where it would begin. It won't begin at zero, but it'll begin at some new pedestal value. And then, apparently, the slope of this line is going to decrease. It'll become something flatter because it's going to get from this new point, y-intercept, and it's still going to go all the way to 1 because that hasn't changed over here in the way in which I've done it. That's what's going on. That's how this thing works. So it basically is adding a pedestal value and then rescaling all of the remaining space into the uh, available grayscales from that point. Let's look again at uh, let's look at this again, but this time let's manipulate the black, uh, the white point, the high range. So sliding this with the high range again does kind of the inverse operation. Now we're going to, instead of outputting white, we're going to output something more gray, something less than white, and then all the other gray scales get rescaled within this new regime of brightnesses. Another interesting thing that I noticed, oh, going the wrong way, is that if you put this at minus one, it's a little bit special and it gives you some indication of the pattern, minus one gets an input of zero and it outputs well, 50% gray, look at that. 127 is 50% gray. Notice how the x value there is a 0.5. That's, again, the normalized, halfway normalized result of 50% gray. Now, minus 2 uh, apparently is going to be something progressively going more towards the right. So let, let me press Enter and see what happens here. So instead of outputting 0.5, now we're outputting 0.66, which sounds suspiciously like two-thirds. So we had one-half, then we get two-thirds, and if I do minus three, I might expect there to be a three-quarters, and, uh, and so on. This isn't important. The only thing I think that's important about this discussion, let's see if this is actually three-quarters. That's pretty close to three-quarters, 0.74. So the only important part of this discussion that I'm trying to demonstrate is that by using a tool like this and looking at the histogram, we can really divine even perhaps better than what the manual explains as to what the tool is doing. Now, we know what it's doing. We still might not know why. <laughs> that might be an important consideration as well. Well, here's what, here's what I think uh, that you could use these sliders for. I, I think there is 
uh, a powerful one. It's with masks. Masks are interesting in the sense that maybe you have a mask where you want it to be permissive in some areas that are currently black, but in everywhere else, um, just rescale the grayscales accordingly. So this is a way to kind of do a, a, a transparency, or a, not really a transparency, but an opacity, if you will. It's a degree at which you want the mask to be applied in general, plus all the other um, effects that you currently had in the mask, you know, for stars or galaxies or anything else. Those are going to be still doing what they should be doing, plus a permissiveness on only the black regions. So what that means is we could make black here more permissive if this is a mask, pretend this image is a mask. We would start by making it 50% gray. So we put it at, well, that's almost 50% gray. So we put it at minus one or something close. We apply. And now what we've done is we've said, okay, now we have just to begin with gray and then getting brighter, 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 brighter all the way up to white from that point. And that makes the mask much more permissive. Now, we don't have to do this much, right? Maybe we do only a little bit instead of minus one. Perhaps we do something like this. We just do a little more gray. Uh, but it gives you um, some interesting variability, some interesting adjustment power with masks. And, and I'm only manipulating the, the dark end, but we can manipulate the bright end as well. Let's say we, you know, the very brightest things. Let's say that all the stars in your image you wanted whatever effect that you're, that you're doing. Maybe it's deconvolution, maybe it's something else, but you want all those stars to be a little bit grayer. That is, not to show the effect quite as much, uh, but everything else you want to remain pretty much the same, to be rescaled. So you can apply a high range adjustment here, apply this to the image, and we will make things much more gray on the higher end things and rescale everything in between. So now I've done both ends here. I've done both the kind of the dark end and the bright end to this image. So that's a mask idea. Now there's more. There's potentially another idea, which is let's say that you have an image that might suffer from a form of quantization. Uh, let me just show you a very brief example. Let's open, I have an HA image of a very, very faint nebula. So I'm going to do the screen. Well, I, I'm going to actually get the tool out here. Let me get the screen transfer function out. So I've done the automatic STF to this image, and I'm going to take these values, put it into these parameters, put it into my um, histogram transformation tool, and then of course apply it to the image, turn off the automatic STF, and now I have the stretched version, right? So we are now looking at the histogram of this nonlinear image. But here's the problem. These values here, the values of the very left side of this histogram, they're still so close to the sky values that if I continue to stretch this image and try to look at what the data looks like on my monitor, you're going to see this quantization because most of the significant values are caught up in the decimal points. And in order to get them out of the decimal points, I need to somehow multiply these values, but, uh, but leave myself enough headroom to still increase the contrast. That's what this dynamic range adjustment kind of does for us. What you can imagine doing, and I'm not saying this is the perfect data to do this with, but let's say we expand the bottom end. That means I'm going to make things a little more gray here, like that. That's a lot gray. Make a little more gray there, right? By doing so, we're going to shift everything. We're going to make this image more gray, like that. And now I have more room here to potentially adjust the contrast, that is to make my black level come up to the point, but not enter where there's interesting data. And then make, because we've made more uh, grayscales available, I'm now expanding this region to increase the contrast of the very dimmest parts of this image. I've brightened things up. I might do one more adjustment here with the black level like this. And this might be a way to increase or show this very, very faint nebulosity without suffering 
one of the things that can happen, which is a kind of quantization, which looks ugly. It looks like you'll see individual, I don't know what to call it, isophotes of these pixel values, because you'll see a whole bunch of pixels are kind of at one value and then another at another value and so on. So this dynamic range expansion may help offset that particular effect that you can sometimes see in, in this case in narrow band imagery. So this may have been a little bit off topic, but I hope that you can see, uh, you know, not only how tools might be used, but even the way to investigate figuring out how a tool works. That's important not only in PixInsight, but just about any other piece of software you might interact with.